it's sailing trophy. I'm talking about more of the mainstream sports. Nothing wrong with sailing by any means, but uh, the, uh, the Stanley Cup, as we'll find out in a few moments' time, goes back to 1893. Number three, you get a chance to take it home with you. If you're on one of the Stanley Cup winning teams, you get to have the Stanley Cup for 24 hours to do with it basically as you wish. And that's pretty rare in, in any, any uh, area, especially in the sports arena as well. Number four, it's been used and abused, which makes the stories legendary. There are so many stories about things that have happened to the Stanley Cup, with the Stanley Cup, but it's just, these are the sorts of stories that make the, uh, make the history of the Stanley Cup quite legendary. Number five, the players get it first. So often with various sports, and again, there's nothing wrong with it necessarily, but the commissioner or the president of the league will hand it to the team owner or the team general manager. In hockey, it's entirely flipped around. The commissioner of the league, in this case, Gary Bettman, will hand it to the captain of the team. They get to parade around the rink with it and share it amongst each other and kiss it and hug it. And then it goes to the, uh, the management and the owners of the team as well. And the final one, and it kind of plays along with the number four, but the final one is the stories of the cup. And that's what makes it so special. The history of the Stanley Cup is extraordinary because of the stories that go with it. So those are my, my boiled down versions of why the Stanley Cup is, is so very, very special. And, and I'm, I'm going to outline a lot of those today while we have a chance to be together here. So as I mentioned, the yeah. Stanley Cup goes back to 1893, but I'm gonna go back even earlier than that. 1889, there's something called the Montreal Winter Carnival taking place in Montreal. And, and so the vice regal, in this case, the, the governor general of Canada, his name is Lord Stanley, his photo up there on your screen. Lord Stanley is new to Canada. He's come over from England as the emissary from Queen Victor Victoria. And he all of a sudden is in a country that he knows absolutely nothing about. He's a, a, a wealthy, he comes from a wealthy background. In fact, his father was the prime minister of England. He comes to Canada and all of a sudden, what the heck is this weather? What the heck are these sports? He was used to playing uh, cricket, rugby, croquet, and things of that sort. And all of a sudden, he's thrust into the middle of a, a winter and finds out that tobogganing and lacrosse and hockey are, are much more palatable to uh, the residents of this country. So 1889, as I mentioned, he gets invited to the Montreal Winter Carnival. And he comes and he's there with his wife, Lady, Lady Stanley, and three of his children. He had 10 children, three of his children as well. And they know so little about hockey that when they are brought to the rink, they walk across the ice to get to the vice regal chairs on the end. And they have to stop the game. The band plays uh, God Save the Queen. And, uh, you know, the governor general waves to everybody and thank you very much, everybody. And everybody kind of snickers. The players are kind of snickering that uh, this man really has no idea what he's doing. They sit and watch the game and they really have a good time. And he's talked about it afterwards. He's talked about the game afterwards and quite enjoyed it, especially the more physical aspects of the game. But where this needs to go is his children. His three children are there, Arthur, Algernon, and Isabel and they fall in absolute love with hockey. And so when they go back from Montreal to Ottawa, which is where their residence was, they decide they want to play hockey. So they make a rink at Rideau Hall, which is still in existence today. Not the same ice, but the rink is made every single year at Rideau Hall, which is the home of the Governor General. And, uh, and the boys, especially Arthur, forms a team. Arthur forms a team he calls the Rideau Rebels, and they ask uh, their father, Lord Stanley, if, he can, if they can borrow the family train. Of course, they didn't have cars back then, so they used the vice regal train to, cr to travel around uh, Ontario to play just kind of random games against different people as they went. Algernon played as well, but Isabel, 14 years old, she becomes... She puts together a team of, of parliamentary assistants, and in, in our way of thinking, it's the very first so woman so to play hockey team. back then. So the kids then start to hound their dad. Dad, why don't you donate a, 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 a championship trophy for Canada? And he, well, we can do that, I guess. So they decide they're going to donate a trophy. 
So there's an athletic banquet that takes place in Ottawa on March 18th, 1892. Lord mm -hmm. Stanley is at a curling match, so he's not even there, but he asks one of his aides to join the, the people who are at the banquet to talk about what his intent is. So Lord Kilcourzy, his aide, steps up front and reads to everybody a note from his boss, Lord Stanley, and it says, I have for some time been thinking that it would be a good thing if there were a challenge cup, which should be held from year to year by the champion hockey team in the Dominion of Canada. There does not appear to be any such outward sign of a championship at present, and considering the general interest which matches now elicit, and the importance of having the game played fairly and under rules generally recognized, I'm willing to give a cup which shall be held from year to year by the winning team. Well, the, the, he, they get a standing ovation for that announcement. And so Lord Kilcourzy is now, now given the task to go back to England and come up with a trophy for Lord Stanley to donate to the game of hockey. And he, so he goes to London, England, and, uh, and he finds a beautiful Rose Bowl and uh, decides that they'll get it engraved very nicely. You can see there, it's got uh, Lord Stanley of Preston and the family, uh, family, I was gonna say motto, it's not the motto, the family crest on the trophy as well. And then on the other side of the trophy, which is really quite peculiar, it's the actual name of the Stanley Cup. It's not the Stanley Cup, it's the Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup. And so if you take a look at the other side of the trophy coming up right there, yeah, you can see it. It's difficult to read, but the actual name of the Stanley Cup is the Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup. Now, nobody ever, ever called it that. As soon as it arrived on Canadian shores, it was called the Stanley Cup, and rightfully so, came from the donor. By the way, uh, Lord Stanley was so nonplussed with the trophy at the time that when some journalists asked him, what do you think about this trophy? He says, well, I guess it looks like just about any other trophy. So it was not a big, big deal to, uh, to Lord Stanley whatsoever. Interesting at this point, Lord Stanley's brother passes away. He now has to, Lord Stanley now has to go back to England to actually to go to Liverpool. And so he has to, to leave the governor generalship six months early or so. So the very first time that the Stanley Cup is awarded is 1889, sorry, 1893, pardon me, 1893. By this point, Lord Stanley has gone back to England, so he never saw his trophy presented. And to this date, nobody from Lord Stanley's family, going back five, six generations, has ever seen the Stanley Cup presented to the championship team. Well, so it's really interesting. It starts off as basically a glorified Rose Bowl, it cost 50 guineas at the time, which was just over about $100 at the time. And, and uh, the very first recipients are this team that you see on the screen. It's the Montreal Hockey Club playing under the umbrella of the, of the uh, Montreal Amateur Athletic Association. And there's the Stanley Cup right there in the center. You can see it's quite small, certainly different than the one that we know today. And, uh, and they're the very first recipients of the Stanley Cup. And everybody on the team gets a nice gold band, almost a tradition that has be, been started again some decades later, but they get a very simple gold band to wear as emblematic of their, uh, their Stanley Cup championship, and they get the team's name on the Stanley Cup. Well, the trophy has grown through the years. Um, what has ended up happening is that all the teams wanted to have their name engraved, as you can imagine. Well, there's only so much room on that little Rose Bowl, so all of a sudden, they had to add extra bands and the trophy started to grow. And then one of the teams, the Montreal Wanderers, uh, Montreal Wanderers came forward and they decided that very randomly, they were going to carve their names into the bowl of the cup. They wanted each of the players' names engraved. Well, nobody had thought of it before. It was actually a pretty cool idea, but it spawned another idea. Hey, we don't just want our team name there. We want all of our players' names on the cup as well. So next thing you know, the cup started to grow even further because it needed to grow taller and taller and taller. The decision was made in 1924 to make it official that now players' names would be added to the Stanley Cup at this particular time. Um, and, and the reason they did that was so they, didn't, they discouraged people from carving with their pen knives into the, uh, into the actual trophy. 
by 1939, the trophy uh, got into a standardized form where all of a sudden now it, it, was, it was by rote. The team name, the year, and the players as well. So I'm going to step back for just a moment's time and talk about 1919. There are a lot of parallels with 2020 as well. 2020, we're in a pandemic. 1919, there was the Spanish influenza pandemic as well. And it was raging through Canada and the United States. And a very strange thing happened at that particular time. At that time, which is entirely different than today's Stanley Cup, the West, which was the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, played against the East, which was the National Hockey Association, the precursor to the NHL. So the Montreal Canadiens happened to be the Eastern Championship, uh, Eastern Champions. They were the, the, um, the winners of the NHA, National Hockey Association. So they took the train across Canada. Now you have to remember that the First World War was just coming to an end at that particular time. And in fact, the Spanish influenza had flourished all throughout the world. It wasn't necessarily, in fact, it wasn't a, something specific to Spain by any means. That just happened to be where the first cases were reported. But the Spanish influenza flared. And by the time the Montreal Canadiens got to, to Seattle to play against the Seattle Metropolitans, a number of the players were quite ill. Several of them couldn't play in, in, the, uh, in the tournament at all. In fact, they, they were sick in the hospital in Seattle. But the rest of the team played on, and they were coming down to the Stanley Cup final. They were going to play their final game. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Oh, okay. They're coming down to April 1st. They're going to play the Stanley Cup final, and Montreal is not able to ice a team at that point. One of their stars, Joe Hall, they called him Bad Joe Hall, was so sick that in fact he succumbed to the Spanish influenza just a couple of days later. Several other players on the team were left in the hospital as well. The owner of the team, George Kennedy, was unable to, to even show up to the arena. In fact, he was flown, but not flown, so he was trained back to Montreal and he succumbed to the disease shortly thereafter. So instead of, of finishing the Stanley Cup and declaring a winner, what they decided to do was call the entire final off. And on the Stanley Cup, as you can see, it's hard to see, but on 1919, Montreal Canadiens, Seattle Metropolitans, series not completed. Other than the lockout in 2005, that's the only time that the Stanley Cup has not been awarded. So we continue on. Um, we're going to talk about the, the shape of the Stanley Cup now for just a moment's time. You know, it, it, it grew, and as it grew, it grew unwieldy. You can see in the next shot that the, the Stanley Cup, for a little while, many people called it the Elephant Leg Cup, just uh, derisively, or the Cigar Stanley Cup. It just grew in that fashion in order to accommodate each of the players on the team as it grew. But it was getting so tall and so heavy that it was cumbersome. So a rule was made in 1948 that the Stanley Cup was going to be redesigned. They were going to create more of a barrel base and they were going to keep the Stanley Cup at the very top, the, the original uh, Rose Bowl, and they would change the shape of the Stanley Cup moving forward. So they did exactly that. Now, what happens now is it's been decreed that, that the Stanley Cup will stay the same shape it is right now. It will never grow to be taller than it is, which is three feet tall. But what they do now is that there are five bands that circle the Stanley Cup. And... 13 teams fit on each of these bands so that when the bottom band, which is the one that the Tampa Bay Lightning were just engraved on last week, they were added to the bottom band. There's still room for seven or eight more teams to be, to be filled on that particular band. But when it's filled, what will happen is that the top of the bands will be taken off. Each of the other ones will be moved up one, and they'll put a brand new band on the bottom. The top band that was taken off will be flattened out and retired in the Hockey Hall of Fame. So the Stanley Cup will, in perpetuity, remain the exact same size as it is right now, the same shape as it is right now. The sad part, <clears throat> pardon me, is that if there are any Montreal Canadiens fans, just as an example, in the late 1950s, the Montreal Canadiens won five Stanley Cup championships in a row. Unprecedented. The only franchise ever to do that. And there are some of the most incredible names who played on the team, some that may be familiar to you. 
Jacques Plante, the goaltender. Rocket Richard, Maurice Richard, also on there. Butch Bouchard, Dickie Moore, all the gentlemen who are in the Hockey Hall of Fame. You know, as much as the game stands on the shoulders of the giants that went before, those giants are no longer on the Stanley Cup. They're now on the flattened band that is retired into the, the vault of the Stanley Cup. So I want to talk about that too. There are actually three Stanley Cups now. Actually, while we're looking at the engraving here, I use the term engraving all the time, and so does everybody else. But in fact, the young lady, she's not that young, but she, uh, the lady who does the, the, what I'll say engraving, she would smack me upside the head if I was to say that. She actually stamps the names into the, uh, into the bands that go on the Stanley Cup. She does each one. Every name is hand stamped and takes about 30 minutes to stamp into the, uh, the silver of the cup. At one time, it would have been actual silver. Now it's a silver alloy. And so it takes her forever to do, to do the, uh, the stamping of the Stanley Cup. I almost called it engraving again. But with somebody who's doing this by hand, there's the chance of mistakes. <laughs> And uh, the mistakes have been made. And that's one of the great stories that makes the Stanley Cup great as well. So just as an example, I mentioned the Montreal Canadiens a few moments ago. Jacques Plante was the goaltender, one of the greatest goaltenders of all time. They won the Stanley Cup five times in a row. He was the first team all-star five times in a row. He won the Vezina Trophy for the lowest goals against average five times in a row. So just a legend. The first one in contemporary hockey to wear a mask as well. And poor Jacques Plante has got his name stamped onto the Stanley Cup five times, spelled five different ways. It's J. Plante, it's Jacques with a C, it's Jacques with no C, it's Plante with no E on the end, it's uh, poor Jacques Plante. <laughs> but these are the kinds of stories that make the Stanley Cup so very, very special. Uh, I'm going to talk about the fact that there is more than one Stanley Cup. And there has to be, and there, here's the reason why. The original Stanley Cup that Lord Stanley donated back in 1893 is too brittle, it's made of real silver, too brittle now to be, to be moved around. So it's retired permanently in the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's still that Rose Bowl size with a little bit of an ebony base and a plaque on it that says Stanley, it actually says Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup on it. So that's the one Stanley Cup. Then those of you who may have watched hockey over the last uh, couple of months saw the Tampa Bay Lightning win the Stanley Cup as well. And part of the routine is, is that uh, gentlemen will, will walk out from the Hockey Hall of Fame. They're called Keepers of the Cup. And they'll walk out wearing white gloves, carrying the Stanley Cup, take it to center ice, pass it over to Commissioner Gary Bettman, who, as I mentioned earlier, will then present it to the captain of the winning team. Well, that particular trophy is called the Presentation Cup. It's still the Stanley Cup, but that's the Presentation Cup. That's the only Stanley Cup that leaves the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's the one that accompanies each of the winner, winners of that team. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier as well, everybody on that team gets to have the cup for a period of time. In non-pandemic times, it would be for a full day. During these pandemic times, it was abbreviated and the rules were changed a little bit as well. But uh, that's the one that leaves the, the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame. When that one leaves the Hall of Fame so that we don't disappoint patrons who come to visit the Hockey Hall of Fame, there's what we call the second version. And the second version is an almost exact duplicate of the Stanley Cup that's the Presentation Cup, but it's the only one that stays in the Hockey Hall of Fame. While we're talking about the, uh, the, the I was going to call it engraving again, I might as well, I'm so used to it now. While we're talking about the engraving, there's only one way that I can tell the difference between the Presentation Cup and the second version. 1984, the Edmonton Oilers win the Stanley Cup. They submit their names to the National Hockey League and the National Hockey League approves them and says, um, yep, you're good to go. So Louise Saint-Jacques in Montreal starts to then strike each of the names and gets them all ready. And when, uh, when it's done, she sends it back to the National Hockey League and the Hockey Hall of Fame, and they look at it and they go, wait a minute, who the hell is Basil Pocklington? Well, what had happened was that after the NHL approved it, the owner of the team, excuse me, 
pardon me, uh, the owner of the team, Peter Pocklington, snuck his dad's name onto the list. So Louis St. Jacques, not knowing any, any better, put Basil Pocklington's name on the Stanley Cup. The NHL said, wait a minute, no way. He has nothing to do with the team. So in the Presentation Cup, there are 16 X's over top of Basil Pocklington's name. That way she didn't have to redo the entire band with all of the, uh, the teams on it. On the second version of the cup, they just didn't bother putting it on. So that's the only way I can tell the difference between the, uh, the Presentation Cup and the second version of the cup. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, the uh, wonderful traditions that, uh, that goes on is having your name stamped onto the Stanley Cup. And it stays there for now 65 years. So if you were to win it this year, a member of the Tampa Bay Lightning, your children and your children's children would get a chance to see your name on the Stanley Cup before that particular band was retired to the Hall of Fame. Some of the great stories that, uh, that go on are, are things that make things legendary as well. I'm gonna show a picture now of a, a hockey player by the name of Red Kelly. Now, Red Kelly played with the Detroit Red Wings before he joined the Toronto Maple Leafs. He won the Stanley Cup four times with Detroit. He joined the Maple Leafs and he won it four times with them. So other than Montreal Canadiens hockey, hockey players, he's won the most Stanley Cup championships for a non-Canadian, Montreal Canadian player. All of the other ones who have won the cup more often all were Montreal Canadiens. We'll get into that in a moment's time. Red Kelly's got an interesting story. Lovely, lovely man. We lost him just over a year ago. So during 1967, the Stanley Cup was uh, being competed for between the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Red Kelly was injured. And in fact, he wasn't even able to be in the arena at that particular time. He had a leg injury that made him stay at home. So the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup in 1967. For those that are going to deride me, yeah, that was the last one they won. Anyway, the owner of the team, Harold Ballard, decided that he would bring the Stanley Cup with a couple of bottles of champagne to Red Kelly's home in the western part of Toronto. Red Kelly and his family were ecstatic. They couldn't believe it that they had the Stanley Cup in their home. That just didn't happen back in those days. For the most part, the Stanley Cup, <clears throat> pardon me, the Stanley Cup Stanley. stayed with the team and that was it. So, so... The, the family is enjoying their time with the, the family is enjoying their time with the Stanley Cup, and they have a newborn baby, so they decide that they're going to put Kelly in the uh, the Stanley Cup, and they put St Kelly in the cup, and and they get some pictures, and when they go to take Kelly out, they realize that Kelly left a little surprise for everybody in the cup. Did everything in the cup, as Red Kelly would say. So now, whenever he sees people picking the cup up and drinking out of it or eating out of it, he has the greatest laugh, knowing that his uh, before he passed, knowing that his daughter left quite a surprise in the uh, in the bowl of the Stanley Cup. We're going to uh, go way, way back, 1904. The Ottawa Silver Seven, long, long defunct now, but they had some uh, some great times. They <laughs> they. Uh, they won the Stanley Cup several times in a row. So it was an early dynasty, probably the first dynasty of Stanley Cup teams. And they were lugging the, the Stanley Cup back and forth. It was a much smaller version at the time. And because they'd had a few cocktails at that particular time, one of the players went ahead and, uh, and challenged one of the other players to kick the Stanley Cup into the Rideau Canal, which was frozen over at that particular time. Well, sure enough, they get out of the car, he, he drop kicks the, uh, the Stanley Cup and it goes skidding across the ice on the Rideau Canal. And they were so, well, they had a few cocktails, as I said. Um, they continued on to their party, forgetting that they had left the Stanley Cup there. It wasn't until they were at the party and somebody said, hey, let's see the cup, that they realized, oh my God. They drove quickly back to the Rideau Canal and sure enough, there was the Stanley Cup right there on the ice where they had left it, luckily just uh, before. 1924, another story sim with a similar sort of theme. The Montreal Canadiens are celebrating the Stanley Cup victory at a downtown hotel, and they've got the, uh, the Stanley Cup with them, and they're leaving the hotel to go to the owner's home. Leo Dandoran was the uh, owner's name. So they're, they're heading there, and on their way to Leo Dandoran's home, they get a flat tire. 
So everybody piles out of the car. They take the trophy and anything else that they've got. They put it at the side of the road. They change their tire. They get back in the car and drive to Leo Dandaran's home and then realize that they're missing something. They jump back in the car. They head back. And sure enough, where they were changing their tire, there's the Stanley Cup sitting there just exactly where they left it and nobody had taken it away. 1962, Chicago and Montreal are playing in the semifinal for the Stanley Cup. They're in Chicago at that particular time. The Stanley Cup is on display in a glass case in the lobby of Chicago Stadium. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. There we go, that's a little bit better. They're in the lobby of the uh, Chicago Stadium. Chicago was beating Montreal five to one at that particular time. One of the gentlemen who uh, was a big Montreal Canadiens fan, in fact, he had traveled by bus to get there to watch his beloved Canadians, figures, wait a minute, no way is, is my team not going home with the cup. So he jimmied the lock. Nobody was around, took the Stanley Cup out, and there he is with the three-foot Stanley Cup walking out of Chicago Stadium. And Usher says, hey, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Sure enough, they call some, uh, some policemen over. The, uh, the gentleman who was quite intoxicated says, hey, I was just taking the cup back where it belongs. He was fined. I think it was a, a feeble fine of you know, $10 or something as, as unremarkable as that. They put the Stanley Cup back in the case, and they had somebody uh, watching at that particular time. I saw somebody left a little message about the New York Rangers, 1994. Quite a legendary time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Quite a legendary time. Mark Messier and the boys have a great time with the Stanley Cup. They take it every place that can be imagined, including some, uh, well, strip clubs, actually. And they have them there, and it's being passed around to fans of the, uh, of the, uh, of the team. And the young ladies who are disrobing are putting their clothing in the Stanley Cup at that time. And somebody drops the Stanley Cup and breaks the top, the, the uh, cup, right off of the barrel. Messier and Graves decide that they're, Adam Graves decide that they have to fix this very quickly. They take it to a local mechanic that they know who, who uh, welds the bowl back onto the, uh, the barrel of the cup. It had a decided uh, lean at that particular time, but they returned the Stanley Cup at that particular time. And, uh, and that's when the NHL decided that there would always be someone called a keeper of the cup to accompany the Stanley Cup, which hadn't been done before that. So it was 1995 with the New Jersey Devils that all of a sudden they had somebody wearing the white gloves who would accompany every one of the winners to their specific party, whether that was the party in their backyard or in a restaurant or taking it to the cemetery to, to be with loved ones or wherever they happened to go, that's where the, uh, the keeper of the cup went as well, which is a wonderful job in many, many ways. But you can only imagine that when there are, you know, 27 players on a team, thereabouts, probably some, some other players as well, um, management and staff and scouts and everybody else, the summer is pretty much monopolized. And so they have to go day in and day out, almost without a break. So if the party goes till midnight or one o'clock, the keeper of the cup wraps it up, takes it back and has to drive off or fly off or wherever to the next place. The only time that they really have a break is when they go over to Europe. They change cup keepers at that time and, and get a new, a new uh, fresh troop of, of cup keepers to go on at that time. So there we go. It was Gary Bettman, the, uh, the commissioner of the National Hockey League, who decided that wouldn't it be a great, uh, a great tribute for every player on the team to be able to have some time with the Stanley Cup. And so he was the one, you know, a lot of people deride him for different things that he has or hasn't done. But that was one of his innovations, and it's one of the wonderful, wonderful traditions of hockey at that time. Imagine winning the Stanley Cup. You get your name on the Stanley Cup, and you actually get to celebrate with it for 12 hours, 14 hours, whatever, to do with basically as you wish. So, uh, so there you go. That's, uh, that's one of the great traditions of that time. You know, when, you, when the winners are, are get, seeing their name on the Stanley Cup, there's the great tradition that – that uh, goes before them. We talked about standing on the shoulders of, of those who went before. Let's talk about uh, those who get to look at the Stanley Cup and they see the name Bobby Orr on the Stanley Cup. 1970, 
1972, 1970 specifically, there's that famous shot of Bobby Orr flying through the air after he scores a goal against Glenn Hall in the St. Louis Blues net. Great shot, wonderful shot, Superman type shot. There's Noel Picard who's in behind Bobby Orr. I had the great luxury of, of spending a little bit of time with Bobby Orr a few years ago. And I went down to his, his uh, man cave, I guess I'll call it. And there was a lovely picture of this particular shot on Bobby Orr's wall. And there was a note, it was from Noel Picard and it said, hope you have a nice fall, but, uh, Noel Picard. And so they have a, I guess Noel Picard has become famous because of this, uh, this shot. Otherwise he'd be one of those people that the real fans of hockey might remember the name, but otherwise you would have no other reason to, uh, to remember it. But Bobby Orr got a chance to drink out of the Stanley Cup just twice. It's one of the hardest trophies to win. One in 1970, 1972. I think many people who were fans of the Boston Bruins would, would think that uh, the Bruins were so strong. Phil Esposito, Jerry Cheevers, Derek Sanderson, Bobby Orr, Johnny Busick, that they would win several more. But this is a really, really difficult trophy to win. And so the fact that Bobby Orr's name is on the Stanley Cup twice is a testament to his ability, but how difficult it is to win. Somebody else who you'd think would be on over and over and over again is someone who, like Bobby Orr, is arguably one of the greatest players of all time. And that's Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky was the dominant player of the 1980s moving into the 1990s. And Wayne Gretzky, you would think with all of the records that he has, the phenomenal goal scoring prowess and, and point production, that he would have won the Stanley Cup over and over and over again. Well, in fact, he did. He won it four times, 1984, 1985, 1987, and 1988. And that's it. Through his entire NHL career, he won it four times, all with the Edmonton Oilers. That very first one was the one where Basil Pocklington's name was, <laughs> was etched out of the, uh, the trophy. But the great one, as they call him, has won the trophy four times. And that's it. But he's got his name on the Stanley Cup. And those who are winning now, especially the young ones, who weren't even alive when Wayne Gretzky last played hockey in 1999, are able to look. They know the legend of Bobby Orr. They know the legend of, of uh, Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux. You could name any number of players. And, uh, and it's just great to think that their name will be on the same trophy, that they know that the trophy has been hoisted by their hockey heroes as well. So we talked uh, at the very, very beginning of our get-together here about some of the late great legends of the game. And there are so many of them as well. Um, I saw somebody's note talk about the Montreal Canadiens. I talked earlier about how Red Kelly has won the Stanley Cup on eight occasions. Just imagine Henri Richard, number 16 for the Montreal Canadiens, played 20 seasons in the National Hockey League and won the Stanley Cup 11 times. He's, he's won the most for any player who's, who's out there right now. Henri Richard, who we, who we just lost not that long ago. Jean Beliveau, another one who we lost not that long ago either. I think it was five years ago. One of the great gentlemen of the game, terrific hockey player. As a player, he won the Stanley Cup on 10 occasions. He also won it seven times as an executive with the Montreal Canadiens. So he's got his name on the Stanley Cup 17 times. That's more than anybody else in the uh, history of hockey. There's one guy who comes awfully close, though. His name is Scotty Bowman. Scotty Bowman was, uh, was still, still is heavily involved in hockey. He's not quite as active as he was once upon a time, but he's won the Stanley Cup on 14 occasions. Nine times as a coach, five times with Montreal, once with Pittsburgh, three with the Detroit Red Wings. He was the director of player personnel with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He was a consultant with the Detroit Red Wings. And three times he was a senior advisor to the Chicago Blackhawks. So he's got his name engraved on the Stanley Cup 14 times. He's now semi-retired. He joins us on our, our Zoom calls uh, from time to time and loves just a phenomenal memory about the game, the players of the game. He can tell you what period they scored, what year, who was, which defenseman was on when this player beat him here and there. Just one of the great, uh, great uh, personalities, I guess I should say, of the game. Great new book that's out now written by Ken Dryden too. 
So the Stanley Cup has, uh, has been used for many things through the years. And again, it's part of that legend that we talk about. The bowl of the Stanley Cup is, is traditional to be used for various things. Um, it'll fit a number of bottles of champagne, as you can imagine. Lots of beer has been in there too, as you can imagine with the celebrations, but lots of other uses too. Here's Duncan Keith of the Chicago Blackhawks putting his relatively newborn baby into the base of the Stanley Cup. You'll notice that the baby's wearing clothes. They're not having the same accident that Red Kelly's baby had. Lots of babies have been in the Stanley Cup. A few have been baptized in the Stanley Cup as well, putting holy water in the bowl of the Stanley Cup. Next time around, we'll see, a next picture rather, we'll see a horse eating out of the Stanley Cup. That's Ed Olchuk on the right-hand side, who was a, a player with the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, who else did he play with? Can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, here he is. He's heavily into horse racing. And, uh, and here he is feeding oats to his horse out of the Stanley Cup. Why not? Brought luck to the horse, brought luck to the cup. Let's hope too. Next picture over, here's Alex Ovechkin. I can't imagine that anybody enjoyed their time with the Stanley Cup more than Alex Ovechkin. Doing handstands with the cup and you name it. Here he is dishing uh, caviar, Russian caviar, out of the bowl of the Stanley Cup. He did that on several occasions and fed it. Not all of his teammates enjoyed it, but they all had a little try out of it as well. A lot of celebrities have also wanted to be part of it. You know, it's, it's amazing that the Stanley Cup draws hockey fans, hockey players, but also musicians, actors, actresses, politicians, you name it. I could show you pictures for eons, but I just chose a couple just because they were cool photos. Here's David Boreans, who uh, was in the movie, or not the movie, in the uh, TV show Bones. When he was in the TV show Bones, he had a picture of Bobby Orr above his desk. Big, big hockey fan. So the Stanley Cup during its win in with the Los Angeles Kings, I'm not sure which particular year, they brought the Stanley Cup to the set of Bones where David Boreans got a chance to spend some time with it and, and move from there. He's now moved on to a show called Seal Team. Haven't seen it yet. The Cup hasn't visited yet, but David Boreans from, uh, from Bones. Talked a moment ago about uh, bands, not bands on the Cup, but bands who love the Cup. And here's a band out of Boston called Aerosmith. The, uh, the Stanley Cup was visiting with uh, Tuka Rask and some of the, uh, the players, and they got a call from the manager of Aerosmith saying, is there any chance that our boys can uh, get their picture taken with the Stanley Cup? And so there you are, you see the, uh, the guys who uh, have had more than a few parties on their own. In fact, Steven Tyler, the lead singer of, of Aerosmith, says that the only, only object, animate or inanimate, that has partied more than him is the Stanley Cup. And that's probably very true too, but they made a special trip in from their uh, rehearsal space into wherever, wherever the Stanley Cup was at that particular time so they could get their picture taken with the Stanley Cup. getting a little horse and you'll excuse me not Ed Olchucks either. Next picture we've got here is uh, is Michael J. Fox, a Canadian boy by birth going through a, a tough time with Parkinson's now. A hell of a hockey player once upon a time but when the Stanley Cup was in I think it was in New York for this particular time I could be wrong it might have been Los Angeles. Michael J. Fox notified our cup keeper that he would love 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 to spend a little bit of time with the Stanley Cup. So when there was a break in the action, whether that was after somebody's day or whatever it happened to be, <clears throat> Michael J. Fox and his mother were able to come and spend some time. And he went over the, the base of the cup meticulously, running his finger over the names and the same ones that I mentioned earlier. There's Kretzky and Orr and some of his favorites who played with the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. Michael J. Fox, uh, you, you may know from Family Matters, uh, Back to the Future, of course, as well many other shows and, and uh, films too. So there we are. We've come to the end of our history of the Stanley Cup. For many of us growing up though, that we all had one particular dream. We just one day wanted to be able to hoist that Stanley Cup. A dream that has come true for those who've won it. A dream that uh, many of us still relish and, and hope that one day will take place 
Here's Joel Quinville, coach of the Chicago Blackhawks, now coach of the Florida Panthers. But there he is enjoying that particular moment by fluke. Well, not by fluke. I chose this picture because it just shows the exultation. I want it. I want it. Joel and I both started hockey in a little place called Riverside, Ontario, just outside of Windsor, going back when we were seven years old. We played in the same, what was it called back then? Squirt? Whatever it was. We both started, neither one of us could skate very well, but uh, we both started at the same time. So my, my little claim to fame was started with Joel Quinville. He's, uh, well, I, I was going to say he's had more time with the Stanley Cup than I have. Him, him as a champion, uh, me as a, an employee of the Hockey Hall of Fame, I would have to argue that point. So there we go. I'll, uh, I'll pull this uh, to, the, to an end. If you have any questions or comments, I would be very, very happy. Why don't you unmute yourself, ask the question. I'd be happy to at least try to answer the question, and we can talk a little bit more about the legacy of the Stanley Cup. Or versus Gretzky. <laughs> If Orr was the uh, defenseman and Gretzky was a forward. For me, there's no argument. Bobby Orr is the greatest of all time. Wayne Gretzky was a phenomenal talent and, and definitely changed the game in some ways. But Bobby Orr changed the way hockey was played. Before that, an offensive defenseman would be someone like Pierre Pilat, who might get six goals, seven goals a year, maybe get 20 points. He could move the puck up efficiently. But no defenseman has ever led the league in scoring and won the Hart Trophy, uh, sorry, won the Art Ross Trophy for being the scoring champion and won the Hart Trophy on two occasions as the most valuable player that way. So for me, it's Bobby Orr, both guys, great ambassadors for the game, both Orr and Gretzky. They know their value, but they also are wonderful, wonderful ambassadors. Anybody else? Questions, comments, errors, omissions? Sure, you, you didn't mention that Red Kelly, while he was a hockey player, was also a member of parliament. Yeah. You know, there's a handful of guys through the years who, I don't know how they did it. They juggled like crazy. So Lionel Conacher back in the 1920s, Bucko McDonald, who was Bobby Orr's coach, funny enough, was also a member of provincial parliament. Red Kelly, Howie Meeker, who we lost just a couple of weeks ago, was also a, a, a member of parliament. But Red Kelly it was the strangest, strangest story how you know, so the Leafs would play Wednesday nights, Saturday nights, and then they would travel on Sunday to Chicago or Detroit or wherever. So after the game was over, he would take the, the overnight train, excuse me, got the hiccups. He would take the overnight train to Ottawa from Toronto, excuse me, to Toronto, to sit in the, uh, in the benches of parliament and uh, serve his constituency there, come back for the game a couple of days later. So he didn't practice for the team for a couple of times, but he was a, he was a terrific uh, politician, much better hockey player. Well, he, the, other, the other fellow who was, a, who was a member of parliament was Ken Dryden, and he was my MP, and he used to come by and knock on the door, and one of the guys in the call, Eric Weiss, was talking to me one day, and I told him, I said, I can't talk to you right now, Ken Dryden's at the door. He said, what do you mean, Ken Dryden? That Ken Dryden? I said, yeah, he comes by all the time and bothers me. Yeah, you know, well, funny Stan, story. Or he stops at my door every time, too. So, uh, <laughs> Kevin, I, great presentation. This is Eric White speaking, and you can Hi, see Eric. this behind me. I have a question about the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yes, so, sir. The, we, our convention was held in Toronto uh, two summers ago, and I made the pilgrimage. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Is the real cup in the vault, and how is it maintained? So, the, so, as I mentioned, there are three cups. The original Stanley Cup is in the vault. So the, the Hockey Hall of Fame, for those who've not had the chance to visit yet, is in a former bank building at the corner of Young and Front in downtown Toronto. It used to be the Bank of Montreal. It was their head office for a while, and it certainly was a, a, a branch right through until the, uh, the 1980s. Anyway, it's been maintained. The architecture has, has been kept intact. So where would you keep the most valuable thing that you have in a bank? You keep it in a vault. Where do we keep the most valuable thing that we have? Well, we also keep it in a vault. It's the original Stanley Cup. So we keep the one that Lord Stanley donated in 1893. We keep that one in what we call uh, Lord Stanley's vault. And it's kept there. And every night it's, it's locked up and, and uh, yeah, and secured that way as well. While that one's in the vault, 
up front where people can get their picture taken. That's another thing that's different from other trophies too. You are not at this particular time because of the pandemic, but you're welcome to come up and get your picture taken with the Stanley Cup, kissing it, hugging it, touching your favorite player or your favorite team. Not during the pandemic, as I said, but that's something you can do. Anyway, the Stanley Cup is, is on a stand at the front of the Great Hall of the Hockey Hall of Fame. And every night it's taken downstairs into the catacombs, I guess I'll say, and put into a double locked room down there. So, and then it's brought out in the morning. It's, it's polished up every morning, cleaned up, and put back out on display. And there's always somebody standing there to, uh, to watch the Stanley Cup as well. So that one is, is kept there. When that one is on the road, the same thing happens with the second version. Uh, it's also in the catacombs as well, locked away. When the presentation cup is traveling, the second version is put up in the Great Hall of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Thanks. Are, are there any other hockey leagues, such as the one in Russia or others, that have a similar tradition following the Stanley Cup? Well, so the hockey's played in, and I think it's 68 different countries around the world right now, which is extraordinary to me, especially when you think of landlocked countries um, who, who you wouldn't even think would have an arena. Now, there are a lot of expats from Canada and the United States who have moved there for business purposes or whatever it happens to be. But they all have small tournaments. They all have cups of one sort or another, or if they don't have their own tournament, there will be several in the geographic area who have, have tournaments as well. The closest to the, uh, the National Hockey League would be the Continental Hockey League in Russia, the KHL. And they've got, uh, it's very, very similar to the, uh, to the uh, National Hockey League and the Stanley Cup. They've got their own trophies. Um, they've got at trophy, the championship trophy that they allow their players to travel with the same way that the Stanley Cup does. I think at some point, the goal, whether it'll ever happen, but I think the goal is that someday the NHL and KHL will merge. Now, whether that happens or whether that's wishful thinking for the KHL, I'm not sure, but that's the goal. Certainly it's, the, it's in the NHL's, I wouldn't say best interest, but it's certainly on the agenda to talk about expanding the league over the next decade, couple of decades into countries outside of North America. So, at this point, the KHL would be the closest to the, the National Hockey League. Who do you think was the greatest player never to have their name inscribed on the cup? Oh, boy. Well, I guess I would say Marcel Dion. Um, terrific hockey player. Detroit Red Wings, Los Angeles Kings. Uh, came, ended his career with the New York Rangers. One of the great goal scorers of all time. If he hadn't been in the same draft as Guy Lafleur, he would have been the first draft pick overall, I'm sure, and would have had a much more, uh, a much higher profile to his career. He ended up with a number of teams that that weren't championship teams for a number of reasons, and Marcel was by far the best player on that team, but in many cases the best player in the league, despite the fact he didn't necessarily have the same wingers as <clears throat> as uh, different players had as well. Um, Dion in, in Los Angeles had, <coughs> had uh, the, the uh, three kings, excuse me, pardon me one second. And they had uh, great su success there, the triple crown line with Charlie Simmer and Dave Taylor, along with Marcel Dion. And, and for a while, that was one of the hottest uh, lines in the league. Wasn't enough to put Los Angeles into a, a Stanley Cup contention but it was certainly helpful to Marcel. Wayne Gretzky's uh, first year in the NHL, he tied for most points in the league with Marcel Dion. But Marcel Dion won the Art Ross Trophy as the top scorer because he had more goals than Gretzky that year. So really they were tied, but it was Marcel Dion. So quite often forgotten as, the, uh, as one of the great, he's in the Hockey Hall of Fame, but one of the great players, but unfortunately never got a chance to win the Stanley Cup. You could talk about Matt Sundin these days, Bill Gadsby from back in the 60s and 70s. There's a number of really, really good players, but I would put Marcel Dion at the top. Or Lindros? Uh, yeah, Lindros was outstanding, but for a much, much briefer period of time. When he played with Philadelphia, he was unbelievable. He could beat you every way a hockey player could beat you. 
He could beat you with great skill, with his size. He could beat you with his size. If somebody was going to take advantage of him by sticking him or punching him, he'd, he'd uh, knock him down a couple of pegs that way too. But injuries condensed his, uh, his career, unfortunately. He certainly wasn't the same guy after that big hit with Scott Stevens. Uh, when he played in Toronto, when he played in Dallas, different hockey player, unfortunately. Still a great player, but not the same guy who played with Philadelphia. So if, if he had been able to extend his time with the Philadelphia Flyers through his entire career, we would be talking about him the same way. But just because of injuries, I can't put him in that same uh, discussion. Is, is there any agreement to the origins of hockey? <laughs> well, that's one of the great, uh, the great debates of all time. Um, there is. There's a group of, of historians. I'm, I'm in the group as well. The Society for International Hockey Research. They call it SIHR or SIR. And so there have been committees through the years who have done copious amounts of research to try and find out. And it's, it's, hard, it's hard to determine. The game has morphed from different games, shinty and uh, bandy and uh, different games that came over from Europe one way or another through the military that came to Canada by way of Halifax and maybe into Montreal from there. And, uh, and probably from lacrosse in many ways too, in some ways, because the weather in Canada was such that you had ice for extended periods of time. Some of these games were adopted onto the ice, but they weren't hockey. So in 18, and I hope I've got this right, 1879, I believe it is, is the first recorded hockey game. The very first time that the, the game of hockey was in a newspaper, it was in the Montreal Daily Gazette. And it was in the newspaper. It had an actual set of rules. It had a finite period of time, a finite number of players per team. I think it was 14 players per team at the time. Certainly wasn't what we know today, but it was, it was hockey. And so that's because of the, the fact that it had all of those definitions and was actually recorded as well. And it's not just a third, a third party passing the story on to grandchildren and brothers and sisters and, and children, we look at that game in Montreal as the, uh, the very first official hockey game, 1879. Okay, Kevin, I have a question. Um, how do you compare the athleticism of current NHL players to those, let's say, several decades ago, and with respect to just the other major sports in the United States? Oh, boy. So I'm a, I'm a hockey guy through and through and not so much other sports, although I'm certainly aware of them. Let me just use hockey as the, as the medium to, to measure right now. So in the 1960s, as an example, the players would take their skates off in, in the spring, whether they won the Stanley Cup or their season was over, they were eliminated. They would take their skates off and they wouldn't put them back on until training camp started again in the fall. They all had to have second jobs because they couldn't afford to just play hockey. They were making what we would call teachers wages nothing not a not a, a shot at teachers by any means but in the 1960s they would make a, a, a living that would be comparable to a teacher so they were out of shape they would get out of shape they would get into shape by going to training camp and they would tie plastic bags around them and they would run for the first time and they would do their skates and they would all be rusty and so there was really no training and there certainly wasn't uh training 12 or yeah 12 months a year today if you don't train 12 uh -oh. it's, it's not a rule but it certainly is is realizing that your peers out there have kept themselves going they've worked out they've skated they've done all of these things you'll hear guys like Wayne Gretzky say no no during the summer more for minor players, for young players. They should be involved in other things. They should take their mind off hockey. They, they shouldn't be so focused on one sport. Play baseball, play lacrosse, play soccer, whatever. But for guys who are playing competitive hockey, especially with parents not dissimilar to me and, and maybe some of you as well, you want your kid, I don't have children, but you want your kid to be able to make that team. And so you've got them in getting ice time through the summer as well. So they're in great shape. 12 months a year. They're in the gym. They've got special diet regimens. 
Gary Roberts is, uh, is, has uh, championed that, getting diets to, uh, to NHL players, and it trickles down to minor hockey league players too. So it's an entirely different sort of animal. How I would compare it to baseball, football, really, really tough for me to say. I would have to think it's very much the same as that what was once basically a, a, an eight-month-a-year profession, maybe even less than that, has now become a 12-month-a-year profession as well. You have to keep up with the competition. So that's all I can suggest about that, thinking that in my lifetime, guys were smoking on the bench between periods. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Guy Lafleur, exactly. Johnny Bauer, we mentioned him earlier, sneaking into the bathroom between periods and having a smoke. Um, it was, it was, it was the way that uh, that that I was going to say civilization. I don't mean it so much that way. Society was at the time. People smoked much less of it now. Much more aware of of your health and your athleticism. Thank you. I hope I answered the question. I know I didn't exactly, but I hope it gave a little bit of context anyway. Thank you very much. Are we going to take one, one or two more questions? And, yeah. uh, so if you have one, shoot it, shoot it out. Go for it. Do you foresee any significant rule changes coming up by any chance? I don't know about significant, but I do know that the, the board of directors meets twice a year and they always have a full plate of, of suggestions, size of the net, color of the puck, uh, rules about sticks and equipment and things of that sort, putting the red line back into the game to slow it down a little bit, extending the size of the rink, although it would be pretty hard to do because anybody who owns a team right now, they, they've got those premier seats that are right along the side. They're not giving those up anytime soon, but they're talking about them all the time. Do I think of any major ones? I don't think necessarily any major ones, but I do know that the discussion of putting the red line back into the game is coming up more and more often. Hmm. That the game has too many head hits right now. So how can we, how can we pull back on, uh, on head hits? We can slow the game down a little bit and, and get rid of those stretch passes where you know, a forward is looking behind him to get the pass from the defenseman and gets walloped by a Scott Stevens type guy. So whether that comes, I'm not sure. Usually what ends up happening excuse me, is, uh, is that they, they initiate the, uh, the new rules in the junior leagues and or the American Hockey League first and see how they play. Um, I, I guess one that I've forgotten that I should talk about is fighting. Junior hockey leagues in Canada don't allow fighting any longer. In fact, they're talking about getting rid of body checking, although that's because of the pandemic, nothing to do with anything more. But um, we'll fighting be taken out of the game of hockey well there's one there's one group that would say you can't take that out of the game it's it's the good old hockey game it's we love it we're all out of our seats when there's a fight there's another faction altogether that says let's get rid of fighting who needs it we don't have fighting in rugby we don't have fighting in other leagues why do we need fighting here two brutes going at each other the enforcers have pretty much gone out of the game at this point but still in the, uh, in the heat of the game, uh, a stick, an elbow, uh, a taunt, sometimes we'll, we'll see two guys dropping the gloves. It is exciting to watch, but is it necessary? It's a good question and, and something that I know that they talk about on a regular basis. When I say they, the board of directors talks about on a regular basis. Nothing's changed at this point. Thank All right. you. All right. So, Kevin, thank you. That was fantastic. And I hope it was okay. It was fantastic, and we really appreciate it. We've done a lot of baseball. We've done some football. We haven't done hockey, so this was our first hockey webinar. Mr. Yay! Kravitz, I think we have one for basketball coming up, yes, don't we? Yes, we do. We have one coming up December 22nd when basketball was Jewish. I think you guys oh. are really going to enjoy this. Love so, that. That's great. We are trying to uh, hit all the sports. Uh, we had a fantastic turnout. We were peaking there at over 55 uh, right. participants. So, so it's really, really nice. Uh, we're going to make a donation in your name to the cancer cause that I know that you, uh, that you participated in with Rick. Uh, and thank you. Let's thank Rick Ronsberg because he was really yeah. responsible. Yeah, thanks, for Rick. Have to. 
So yes, we have to. Stan. <laughs> okay. Everyone except Stan and Alan. Please thank hot. Rick Ronsberg. Yeah, please. Such you guys, hot. either one. Not bad, not bad for a guy from Canada. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you shouldn't say that in this room. So. Rock the gloves now! Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> Any big fighting out of hockey? Come on! Yeah, you told me. Come on, Danny, Tom, let's go. Danny, yeah. there was a chat question about IKC. I'm, I'm wearing my IKC hockey jersey, and somebody said, "What's IKC?" Stan, would you like to explain that to all to us? I'm wearing my Trail Smoke Eaters shirt. Oh wow! Hometown. Very <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's great. I'm wearing my Oshawa Lady General shirt. <laughs> Very I cool. Find mine. <laughs> I go with the women, baby. <laughs> I should have gone out and found my old Minnesota North Stars jersey. Oh, I my Bruins shirt on. The there Bruins we go. All right. Well, guys, this has been really, really fun for me, too. And really nice to, to visit with you. Rick's been a longtime friend. The fact that you would make a donation in my name, and certainly not necessary, and please make it modest, but really is touching. The uh, Road Hockey to Conquer Cancer event that we do has raised $23 million for cancer research to date by playing a game that we played when we were kids. So thank you for that and thank you for those who will benefit from it. Have a great holiday everybody and thank you again for having me as part of your family today. Thank you. Thank, you. You, thank you. You hit coast to coast from yeah. Southern California up to Canada so it was wonderful to have What's us. The book? And gentlemen, happy Hanukkah. It's in two yeah. nights from tonight so Coming up. And uh, thank you again, Kevin. We'll see you everyone at the uh, oh, Hey, Rick, is Friday. that Thank hey, Kevin, yeah. Kevin uh, Kevin, Thank how you. Do, how do we get your book? Right. How do we, how do we get your book, book Kevin? Kevin. It's a great day for hockey. <laughs> if anybody's interested, why don't you talk to Rick? I would be uh, more than happy if anybody's interested. I've got, uh, I've got a new book out about the Toronto Maple Leafs. That one is about the Hockey Hall of Fame, which is a really nice coffee table book. If anybody's interested, and again, no obligation whatsoever, but uh, might make a nice gift or something, why don't you contact Rick and we can be in touch and uh, we we'll take care of business and go from there, okay? Thank you, everyone. Great. Have Thank a good night. Thank you. Thank good night, you, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Kevin, Rick, Danny, Dave. We'll Thank you very much. Talk to you again, Kevin. Thank you. Care. Care. Great Thank job. You. Okay, everybody. Thank you.